In this lesson, we will learn how to perform the chi-square goodness of fit test. AutoRex Inc. sells auto insurance. AutoRex keeps close tabs on its customers' driving records, updating its rates according to the trends indicated by these records. AutoRex records indicate that, in a typical year, roughly 70% of companies' customers do not commit a moving violation. 10% commit exactly one moving violation, 15% commit exactly two moving violations, and 5% commit three or more moving violations. This past year's driving records for a random sample of 100 AutoRex customers is summarized in the first row of numbers in Table 1 below. This row gives this year's observed frequencies for each moving violation category for the sample of 100 AutoRex customers. The second row of numbers gives the frequencies expected for a sample of 100 AutoRex customers if the moving violations distribution for this year is the same as the distribution for a typical year. The bottom row of numbers in Table 1 indicates the value observed frequency minus expected frequency quantity squared divided by expected frequency for each of the moving violation categories. Fill in the missing values in Table 1, then using the 500th level of significance, perform a test of the hypothesis that there is no difference between this year's moving violation distribution and the distribution in a typical year. Then complete Table 2. Round your responses for the expected frequencies in Table 1 to at least two decimal places. Round your observed frequency minus expected frequency quantity squared over expected frequency responses in Table 1 to at least three decimal places. Round your responses in Table 2 as specified. Here are the tables referenced in the question we just read. Please notice that there are uh, four categories representing the columns of this table. So we have no violation category, exactly one violation, exactly two violations, and three or more violations. The sample size was 100. These percentages I took uh, directly from the uh, question. We were told that uh, about 70% of customers have no violations, 10% have exactly one, 15% exactly two, and 5% three or more violations. So I just wrote this for my reference. The first row, as we are told, indicates the quantities uh, observed, which means out of a random sample of 100 customers, 62 had no violation, 13 had exactly one, 18 had exactly two violations, and 7 had three or more. The expected frequencies, labeled by F sub E, uh, we have to compute ourselves. Two of them are given to us already. Uh, two we need to uh, compute. It's pretty easy to do because all you need to do is uh, find 70% of 100 people in the sample, which is 70 people, or 5% of 100 people in the sample, which in this case means 5 people are in this category. The last row in this table is where we need to do some computations. Notice we will have to use this formula where we take the observed frequency, subtract the expected frequency, then square this quantity, and then divide by the expected frequency once more. So to fill out this cell right here, we will take the uh, observed quantity, 62, minus 70 gives me 8. Don't forget to square it, which is giving me 64, and then divide again by the expected frequency of 70. So 64 over 70 will give you this quantity, 0 0.914, when rounded to three decimal places. We go through exactly the same process to compute the uh, same quantity for the last cell right here. So seven observed minus five expected gives me two. Two squared is four. Four divided by expected frequency. Four divided by five gives me this quantity, 0 0.800, when rounded to three decimal places. Please notice that when you add all four categories in the observed free, uh, row, you should get 100 as your total. 
because we have a sample of 100 people or 100 customers. The expected frequencies should also add up to 100 as well. So when you add these quantities, 70, 10, 15, and 5, we definitely get 100 there as well. So for um, a reference, you can add uh, and get the total for the expected frequencies as well. When you add the last row, you will get the quantity 3.214. And this quantity is your test statistic chi-square, which will be used in your testing process later. Now we continue to the table 2. This table is summarizing the process of your hypothesis testing. Um, it is interesting that Alex does not uh, even ask you to state the hypothesis statement, but I think it's important to understand what exactly we're testing. So I wrote those statements um, right here. Um, so your null hypothesis is going to state the expected um, pro probabilities of these four categories. So we're expecting the probability of no violation to be at 70%, probability of one, one violation to be at 10%, and so on and so forth. Alternative hypothesis is saying, no, in reality, um, some or all actual probabilities differ from the expected ones. In other words, what happened uh, happens in a typical year is not true anymore with this year. And we will look for evidence to support this alternative hypothesis. So first question in your table is asking you to identify the type of test statistic. Since we're working with goodness of fit test, it will be chi-squared. As soon as you choose this option from the drop-down menu, you will be asked to provide the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom from, for this test are found by taking the number of categories, in this case we have four of them, and subtracting one. So four minus one is three. So three is my uh, number of degrees of freedom. So you're going to enter it here. Um, then we're asked to find the value of the test statistic, which we already know is this number, 3.214, except it asks us to round it to two decimal places, so I write it as 3.21. The next question we need to answer uh, is right here. We need to provide the critical value. Please remember that in this course by now, you have found critical values many, many times, and you worked with Z and T distributions. So you were finding, say, Z sub 0.05 or Z sub 0.025 and stuff like that. So similarly, with this kind of test, you are going to have a critical value corresponding to a 5% level of significance. Please remember that chi-square distribution is not symmetric, and you always are, are going to have a right tail set up. So in this case, we see that there is 5% of data in critical region, and we need to find this location, this chi-square value, that will separate the acceptance region from the... Uh, rejection region. We already know where the test statistic is. It's 3.21. The question is, what is this quantity? Well, I already provided it here, but let me tell you how to find it using your calculator. In one of the previous lessons where we introduced the chi-square distribution, I already described how to solve such equations in great detail and demonstrated how to use your calculator. I just want to point out the equation we need to use in this particular case. Please notice again, because we want to find this boundary that separates 95% uh, of data that is between 0 and this unknown value. You can call it x or k or whatever you want to call it. And um, I am setting up the equation and I say the area of 95% should be coming out of chi-squared CDF function starting with lower boundary of 0, upper boundary of x with 3 degrees of freedom. Once you use equation solver on your calculator to input this equation, the uh, outcome, the solution um, that comes out on the calculator will be 7.81. So now I know that 7.81 is this boundary. Therefore, 3.21 is safely in the acceptance region. And when I read this statement, the last statement in the table, can we reject the hypothesis that there is no difference between this year's moving violation distribution and the distribution of a typical year? 
using the 5% level of significance, I will say no because I do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, my expected distribution that I listed here, all these percentages are still holding true. There is not enough evidence that there is significant variation um, uh, compared to this distribution. Now, in this uh, slide, I would like to demonstrate how to use a calculator to uh, perform the hypothesis test uh, quicker. So if you didn't have Alex to ask you all these detailed questions with critical value and you would say decide to, to perform the test using the p-value approach, the calculator could help you to do that. So let's take a look at how we do this. To perform the goodness of fit test, first of all, you're going to, into your lists and you will enter into some uh, two lists that you choose, the uh, observed values versus expected values. So here I am entering the observed values, 62, 13, 18, and 7, and now I am entering the expected values, 70, 10, 15, and 5. Then I'm going into stat and tests and scroll up until I reach the chi-square goodness of fit test. Tell your calculator where your values are stored, and in this case I need to change it to list 1 and list 2, and change your degrees of freedom. In this case there are 3 degrees of freedom. And then just press calculate, and the calculator will tell you what the chi-square test statistic value is, and please notice that the test statistic we found manually is same when rounded to two decimal places as the one that calculator gave me, and it also gives me the p-value, and notice p-value is big compared to the 5% significance level, so I will say that there's not enough evidence against the null hypothesis. So my conclusion using the critical value method ended up being same as uh, the conclusion using the p-value method. So the calculator allows you to do a very quick test uh, if you use the p-value method, which sometimes you will be asked on Alex. This particular question we had to do using critical values, so we had to use this special equation to find the critical value and then decide where my test statistic landed, and it was in the acceptance region, so I could not reject the null hypothesis, and therefore my answer was no. Let's take a look at one more example, and this time we will solve it using the p-value approach. Depression and insomnia often go hand in hand, and sometimes it is unclear which of the two should be the primary subject of treatment in individuals suffering from insomnia. Mendoza and Company, a national pharmaceutical firm, has positioned itself as a specialist in the production of both antidepressants and sleeping pills. Mendoza's current business model describes the following breakdown of America's approximately 50 million adults suffering from insomnia. 17% use both antidepressants and sleeping pills regularly, 24% use only antidepressants regularly, and 15% use only sleeping pills regularly, and the remaining 44% use neither antidepressants nor sleeping pills regularly. A recent issue of the psychiatry journal Patterns contains a study on insomnia. In the study, 160 American adults suffering from insomnia, but otherwise chosen at random, were asked about their use of antidepressants and sleeping pills. The breakdown of their answers is given in the top row of numbers in Table 1 below. These numbers are the frequencies observed for the sample of 160 insomniacs. The second row of numbers in Table 1 gives the expected frequencies under the hypothesis that Mendoza's model is correct. The bottom row of numbers in Table 1 contains the values observed frequency minus expected frequency quantity squared divided by expected frequency for each of the categories of medic medication use. Fill in the missing values of Table 1, then using the 500 level of significance, Perform a test of the hypothesis that the Mendoza's model is correct. Then complete Table 2. Round your responses for the expected frequencies in Table 1 to at least two decimal places. 
and around your observed frequency minus expected frequency quantity squared over expected frequency responses in table 1 to at least three decimal places around your responses in table 2 as specified. Now it's time to take a look at the table. So the table we have here has four categories using both antidepressants and sleeping pills, using only antidepressants, using sleeping pills, or using neither of those two. The first row is provided for us. We have uh, fre observed frequencies 44, 39, 14, 63, total of 160. The expected frequencies are computed by taking the percentage corresponding to this category times 160, um, my sample size. So 160 times 1700 is 27.20, rounded to two decimal places, and 160 times uh, 0.15 is 24.00. The other two quantities are already computed for us. Uh, now we compute the uh, quantities F sub O minus F sub E quantity squared divided by F sub E. So for example, for this first row, 44 minus 27.20, square this difference and then divide by 27.20 to get 10.376. Similarly, 14 minus 24, square the difference, then divide by 24 to get 4.167. When I add all of these quantities uh, in the last row, I'll get 15.33 when rounded to two decimal places. And uh, when I add all of these quantities together, I will get 160. So that's um, an important reminder here. So total four uh, expected frequencies should be 160. And total four, these values in the last row is 15.33. And what it will be three again in the thousands place. But later we will round it to two decimal places as requested in table two. Let's get to table two. It's about time to do that. So again, table two is asking what kind of test statistic you work with. Is it Z, T? Well, we need to choose chi square since we work with goodness of fit test. Degrees of freedom depends on the number of categories. There are four categories. So four categories minus one. K minus 1 gives me 3 degrees of freedom. So here is that computation right there. So I answer 3 for the degrees of freedom. The value of test statistic rounded to two decimal places is 15.33. So here it is. That's my chi-square value. Um, I'm not asked this time for a critical value because we would like to use the p-value approach. So what is the p-value? Well, please remember p-value is the area to the right of this test statistic. So to find that value, I need to use the chi-square CDF function on my calculator from 15.33 to positive infinity with three degrees of freedom. And that produces 0 0.002 as my p-value. The rest of the decision-making looks exactly like it looked for other tests that we performed in the past. Compare p-value to the alpha. Uh, 2,000 is definitely less than or equal to 500. And we have enough evidence, in fact, pretty strong evidence, to reject the null hypothesis. So the last question, can we conclude that the percentages given in Mendoza's model are incorrect? Yes, because we will reject null hypothesis that lists these percentages as uh, my expectation. And in fact, the alternative hypothesis is true because some or all of actual probabilities in this sample are different. Uh, and that difference is big enough at alpha of 5% level of significance. Let's take a look again how we can use a calculator to perform this test very quickly for us, especially if you use the p-value method. It's absolutely easy. So I'm going to enter my data into the lists and I will use two lists, one for observed values and another one for expected values. So I'm entering the observed values 44, 39, 14, and 63. Now it's time to enter the um, expected values 27.2, and 70.4. Go to stat, tests, choose chi-square goodness of fit test, 
tell your calculator where your data is stored, list one, list two, specify degrees of freedom, in this case three, get down to calculate, press enter, and it gives you the uh, test statistic chi-square that we found uh, manually, remember 15.33, it's the same number that my calculator produces, and p-value rounded to three decimal places will be also same. So whether you do this manually or use a calculator, these quantities are pretty easy to find.